Just like every other mountain range I've covered in this series, the Rocky Mountains seem to hold some terrifying stories. Welcome back to the swamp, my friends. It's good to see you made it back for another video. Today, we're going to be sharing some creepy and allegedly true Rocky Mountain horror stories. As always, if you have a story that you would like to share in a future video, whether it be from the Rocky Mountains or a different mountain range entirely, be sure to submit your story at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I'd love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp. It's stories like yours that truly help keep this show going. Now, let's get into these creepy and allegedly true Rocky Mountain Horror Stories that'll creep you out tonight. I live in Alberta, Canada. The story takes place back in June of 2015. I was 28 years old and my fiancé was 32. I will call him Kay for this story. It was going to be an extremely hot day, for we had just purchased our first car after years of taking public transit and decided to go for an overnight trip to Jasper Park. To anyone that does not know, Jasper Park is a beautiful stretch of highway that runs through the foothills into the Rockies. I'm not sure what it is like in other countries, but here in the parks and wooded areas, it is not uncommon for people to pull off on the side of the highway and hike into areas for day trips or even to camp to avoid the overcrowded campgrounds. We had been on the road for about four hours, and I was starting to feel cramped when we came to an area with a beautiful glacier river running next to the highway. So we decided to pull off the road onto an old maintenance road that ran down what we thought was the train tracks that ran parallel to the road. The road was extremely overgrown and had railroad ties sticking up vertically about two feet out of the ground to block the road permanently. But they were spaced apart enough for an exceedingly small vehicle to get through. Well, our new car happened to be one of those tiny economy class cars so we decided to try and fit past the barrier. So Kay got out and directed me through the small opening in between the post, and to my surprise, we actually fit. He decided it would be best for him to walk in front of me and lead me through the overgrown path while I crept the car forward in case there were any more rocks or stumps that could damage the extremely low undercarriage of our new car. After about 15 feet into the road, the grass suddenly became taller than my car and the trees were thick and brushed up against the roof, and the path was dark with light at the end that indicated a clearing. Basically, it looked like something straight out of one of those corny, camping horror movies. But we decided to go forward anyway, and came upon a clear-cut line. These lines were cut out by the government as surveying gas lines. Anyways, we went about 50 feet into the clearing that was surrounded by thick trees on all sides. After finding a flattish area where we could make a makeshift camp, Kay decided to go and try to find where the river ran closest so we could go stick our feet in and cool down. I voiced concern about the bears in the area and wanted to keep the bear spray with me. So, he took his wood axe with him. Side note, most people around here don't really have guns other than hunting rifles due to our gun laws. And due to this, we did not have anything other than a bear spray pocket knives, and an axe for potential defense. I decided to start digging out our tent and to look for a spot to set it up for the night. Kay was gone for about five minutes when I heard what looked like another vehicle close by. I honestly did not think anything of it at the time, thinking, who else could possibly fit their car through there? So, I brushed it off and continued what I was doing. But at the same time, moving my can of bear spray out of my backpack to just inside my trunk where I could grab it in a matter of seconds if needed. Just in case. After another minute or so, I just happened to look in the direction of the road that led us to the clearing. And, to my surprise, I see a man walking towards me. He looked about 35 to 40 years old, with a ball cap and dirty blue reflective coveralls on. You know, the ones you see the oil rig guys wear. After the complete shock of seeing someone, I started to notice I could not see his face that well, but he had on a baseball cap of some sort and shaved with a scruffy beard. 
He was walking directly towards me, and he had his hands in his pockets. I started to panic a little and immediately called out for Kay and for him to get back here. I hear him yell something off in the distance, but I refuse to take my eyes off the stranger who is now less than 20 feet away from me. Now I should mention that the area is known for hunting, but it was not the season. He reaches me and stops about 5 feet away. Being the friendly person I am, I smiled and said, Hi, I did not expect to see anyone here. He looks at me from head to toe and stands there for what feels like forever and then says, uh, Hello, what brings you here? His tone was very blank and not giving anything away. I say, My fiancé and I were just looking for a place to pop the tent up for the night. He freezes at the mention of my fiancé. He looks around as he hears Kay coming through the woods to the right of us. The stranger still gawking at me. He does not move as Kay comes out of the tree line with his axe propped up on his shoulder. Kay looks at me and then the stranger and he immediately speed walks to my side. And being the cautious, overly protective guy he is, he says, Hey man, is there something I can help you with? No, I was just checking my trail cams. The guy then looks at Kay assessing him and glaring at his axe. I ask him, Oh, so you know the area? Do you know if it's okay to camp here for the night? He looks directly at me and says, Yeah, as long as you don't have a fire or anything, and once in a while service trucks do come down here to survey. I say thanks for the heads up and I smile. He will not stop looking at me at this point. Kay sees this and decides he has had enough and says again, Is there something you needed? The guy finally stops looking at me long enough to answer. I was in here checking my trail cams and got a flat on my jeep. He indicates to the bumper of his jeep that is visible through the bush. He continues, I tried changing it to my spare, but I have custom wheels and cannot get the nuts off of the tools I have. Now to be honest, everyone in Alberta definitely knows that if you have a custom truck or go off-roading, you always carry the proper tools. This was alarm number one. Kay and I walk closer to get a better view of his vehicle and note that it is one of those jacked up off-road jeeps with the engine snorkel and everything. I remember the alarms going off in my head yelling at me that this is really weird. Even I carry the tools needed to switch out my tires and I don't even have a fancy car. At this point, I notice his jeep is blocking the only entrance into the clearing. I proceed to say, um, I'm sorry, but as you can tell I only have a small car and my tire iron is only big enough to fit the nuts from my 15 inch wheels. I don't think we'll be able to help you. The guy starts to look annoyed as Kay and I start to move back to our car. The guy follows us back to our car then says, Well, could she possibly give me a lift to Jasper to get help? I immediately start to panic and say, Well, my car is packed to the roof with our camping gear. I am one of those overpackers that has something for every situation, regardless of whether I need it. I am not unloading all my stuff and leaving it here in the woods. The guy starts to get agitated shift him back and forth in place. He then says, It would only be a couple of hours and your fiancé could stay here with your stuff then. And I'm about to say no when Kay very plainly says, I am not letting her drive alone with you and leave me here in the woods. The guy looks at Kay and says, Please, I just need a ride into town or at least to somewhere where I can get a cell reception. Note, there is no reception in most of Jasper Park unless you have a booster or a satellite phone. Even then, it's very patchy service, and the closest town is Jasper itself, which was at least two hours away. He continues to try to get me to drive him by myself for another five minutes before we both get visibly irritated. Kay then says as calmly as he can, Sorry man, you're going to have to walk out to the road and hail someone down. Now the guy is mad and takes one last look at me and turns around and walks towards the road. After he's out of sight, Kay and I immediately pack up the car and start to turn around and head for the clearing. As we pull up to where his jeep is, where it's blocking the access to the road, both Kay and I get out to investigate his jeep. He did not have a flat. There was nothing wrong with his jeep at all. Kay decides to look in the back seat through the tinted windows. He suddenly panics and says we need to get out of there. I do not question him and get in the driver's seat. While Kay takes his axe and clears the brush on the side of where the jeep is blocking the exit, after about 10 minutes of pulling weeds, branches, and rocks, we make a space big enough to creep through. It took us another five minutes to creep through the overgrown access back out of the highway. As we are pulling up to the highway, we can see the creep down. He's hitchhiking. Kay says just drive in the opposite direction. 
so we drove for about 15 minutes and decided to double back and see if he was still there. As we came up to the access again, we noticed he is no longer on the side of the highway. So we pull into the access road again where the makeshift barrier was and immediately notice the jeep is gone. Kay freaks out and we back out of there and drive 45 minutes up the highway to a new spot. We find a nice calm area directly next to the highway where we can access the river. We hang out for a couple of hours while all the time keeping an eye out for that creepy guy. We kept hearing twigs snapping behind us in the overgrowth, but due to the events that day, we decided to, you know, not go investigate. I finally start to relax a little bit and enjoy the sweltering heat. Around 6pm it was starting to get dark because the mountains were blocking the sun, so Kay decides it's time to pack up and leave. I remind him that I had a couple of beers while sitting at the river, so I needed a nap before we go anywhere. He agrees and we go sit in the car, which we had parked on a little makeshift rest area. We hunker down and I try to doze off for a little while. Kay suddenly jerks up and says, Did you hear that? Groggy from just passing out. No, what's going on? Kay says, Be quiet. By this time it is pitch black all around us. Suddenly I hear it. The crunch of gravel and twigs as if someone was walking in wide circles around us. We look at each other then hear it again, as this time it's closer and to the front of the car. I squint as hard as I can and then immediately turn the key and turn on the lights. To our surprise there is no one there. Without saying anything I decide I had rested enough and my adrenaline was coursing through me. I turned the engine over and threw the car into reverse and headed back down the highway towards home. After somewhere around 20 minutes of driving and nerve-wrenching silence, I was constantly checking our mirrors the entire time to see if anyone was following us. I break the silence and ask the question that has been bugging me. So now that we are out of there, what was in the back seat of his jeep that made you so freaked out? Kay looks at me, worry etched on his face, not normal for him at all. He takes a deep breath and says, It was hard to see due to the tint, but I could make out a hunting rifle which is not out of the ordinary for here, but, most disturbingly, there was a roll of duct tape, rope, and a tarp. After seeing that, Kay freaked out realizing this guy wanted more than just a ride from us. I know this may not be scary to most people, but to me this was one of the most terrifying events in my life. This has not stopped us from going out and enjoying the beauty and nature of the Canadian Rockies, but we are much more cautious. I have always been interested in the urban legend stuff. Creepy stories, monsters, cryptids, whatever. I was born in Minnesota, but I have lived in Montana for pretty much all of my life. Pretty much the Yellowstone area. My family is super into the outdoors, camping, hiking, backpacking, hunting, fishing, etc. We are basically the poster child family for that sort of thing. We are regulars in Yellowstone and Glacier and the whole Rocky Mountain area. We frequently travel for our camping trips. If we go out of state, it's usually not extremely far, like Idaho, Wyoming, or Colorado. Recently, we have been fond of the Island Park area in Idaho. I cannot tell you why, probably for the fishing, camping, and ATV access, but we are pretty new regarding that area, and we have only really been spending time down there for about two years now. So far I have a lot of stories from Island Park that I can share later. There is some weird stuff down there. I do not really know if anything has ever happened there or a lot about the history. So if anyone does know, please comment down below, that'd be great. For those of you that have never heard of Island Park who have never been there, here is a brief explanation. In my opinion, it is one of the strangest places in the Northwest. So weird because it is home to a lot of landmarks and sites. It's called a city, but it is essentially just a long road, think of the main street in a major town, that runs through Targhee National Forest, and from this main road are several trails, roads, and accesses where you can find campgrounds and other things. There are a few large neighborhoods where you can rent out cabins and such, but I don't know many people that live there full time. The ATV trails run everywhere, there is really no town area but everything that is civilized is found off the main road, including a particularly good Mexican restaurant. So, 
You'd be on one side of the road for days at a time and not see another person or another gas station for miles. Do not get me wrong, it is a beautiful area with good fishing and it is nice if you want to get away from everyone. But it is a very sketchy area at the same time. There is nothing wrong with it and I would definitely recommend visiting it. The people there are friendly and it is a good atmosphere. I just get an unsettling feeling there at times. For example, there are parts in the forest where every tree looks the same and it is dead quiet, which makes me shiver. It reminds me of that story or joke a while back that Idaho is not real and the government made it up. It makes me laugh every time because Island Park gives off that vibe. Okay, I'm getting carried away. As I said, I have tons of stories about this place. So, my family and I were camping at the Upper Coffee Pot, a campground far in the back of the forest, right on Henry's Fork, a beautiful spot. We were at the head of the campground, so right next to our spot is a trailhead and another spot adjacent to us. All the other camping spots are down the road in the opposite direction. The trail is exceptionally long, like it follows the riverbank the entire time, but it goes all the way up to Trout Hunters, a local spot for guides up to the road 11 miles from the campground. This trail connects to everything. Again, I need to remind myself to focus on the story. On this day, we were hanging around camp, just fishing and being lazy. Sometime around 3 o'clock, my dad and sister and I decided to go up for a hike just up the trail for fun. We get all geared up and throw on our jackets and shoes. The trail is well carved out. You could do it in flip-flops if you had to. We did not grab bear spray, but my dad grabbed a headlamp because, like I said, it's a heavily used area and we didn't plan on being out all that long. We head out and we are chatting and laughing. I have no idea exactly how far we made it. According to my dad, we were close to trout hunters. Looking back on it, now that I have hung around that area more, that was probably not true. Eventually, it starts to get dark and we turn around. Nothing out of the ordinary had happened, but still, anyone knows you do not want to be out miles from signs of people with no bear spray and one light. It gets dark quickly, and there is no moon that night. We are trying to save the headlamp battery in case we really need it, so we are going along in the dark, watching the river, and warning each other, hey, there's a stump right there, and watch out for that dip. All of you who are avid hikers or have been outside at night know exactly what I'm talking about. And you also know, things feel quite different once it's dark. Now, I'm not a wuss. I am a tough chick. Growing up as the oldest out of three girls in my family with parents that raised us to be strong, educated outdoors enthusiast, but even I have my limits, and I am unfortunately the first one to get uneasy or worried about something. But on the opposing end of that, my feelings are normally right. So my family knows to listen to me when I say it's about to go down. So naturally, I start to get uneasy, and I'm starting to get antsy. I start questioning my dad about how much further we have to go. Did you bring matches? Blah, blah, blah. We have no idea what time it is or how long we've been out. None of us had our watches on from fishing earlier, and like I said, time is cruel in the dark. I try to distract myself from every noise I hear by talking and focusing on the path I can barely see in front of me. I am getting nervous because my brain and internal clock think there is no way we should still be hiking. We should be back by now. My mind is running rampant. Who knows, it's thinking about this and that, and the more realistic dangerous bears and angry bull moose that could be around. My dad is getting anxious too and decides to turn the headlamp on to offer some security. We all know there is only one way we're going to get back, and that's to continue walking. But none of us were particularly happy about that current situation, which involved no protection, which was our mistake because of being lazy. But none of us were particularly happy about the current situation, which involved no protection, which was our mistake, of course, for being lazy about our gear and undermining the time of the day. Soon, we can see lights from the campfires in the distance, but they are faint small specks of light and we guess we have about three more bends to go before we will enter the vicinity of the camp. That is about when I got the feeling. I get goosebumps and shiver for a second. Then, from behind us comes this scream. It is very distant, but trust me, anyone can recognize a scream. I have heard a lot of animal sounds in my life and a lot of them are wacky, but this sounded like a rabbit scream. I do not know if you have ever heard a rabbit scream. 
but it's genuinely terrifying. That sound should not come from a small, cute, furry animal. We all stop in our tracks and are silent for a minute. Soon my dad turns to us and says a coyote or something probably spooked the rabbit. I nod and shiver again, and we continue, all a bit on edge. We go about 30 paces ahead and I stop and I get this feeling of dread mixed with terror that shoots down my body. I'm thinking, no, 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 no. I do not know why, but I cannot move, and it was probably because of what happens next. Maybe about 20 yards back, I hear this strange cry come from behind me. I cannot describe it very well because I have never heard anything like it. It was a low whisper, like a sort of screech followed by a rustle and a faint laugh. And I know that sounds silly, but when I say laugh, I do not mean like a chuckle or the joker's laugh. I mean more like a chant. Like two of the same words repeated in a rhythmic fashion. Note that the sound is very faint and low, but I can still hear how close it is. At this point, I'm running to catch up with my sister and my dad, nearly wetting my pants. Getting out of there as fast as humanly possible. Who knows what else is out there, and I'm pretty much scaring myself at this point instead of being rational. I catch up to them, and my sister is pale as a ghost. I ask her if they heard the sound, and she goes, You mean the rustle followed by the growl? Yeah. My dad looks at me and motions for us to keep going. I asked him if he has ever heard anything like that before, and he says it was probably just the same thing we heard before. I kind of got the sense he was lying, but I did not want to say anything because he was acting calm and it kind of calmed me down a bit. We continue around the next bend for a while. Suddenly, we all freeze because there is a rustle a couple of feet in front of us. My dad turns the headlight off, and we all stand there, standing still, holding our breath, not moving a muscle. If it was a bull moose, you do not want to catch him by surprise, so we were all waiting it out. After a minute or so and no other sound, we continued. My dad is shining the lamp on the ground, and then he comes to a sudden halt. My sister and I want to know what is going on, so we take a look. On the ground were footprints. My dad gave a motion for us to be quiet, and we slowly followed them. They started out as a sort of spread out, long, almost human shape. Maybe they were a small bear or a big back foot of a rabbit or something. Now, not one of us were paying attention to where we were anymore. We were looking at the footprints, but my dad looks up and we are 10 feet away from the opening of the trailhead, about 20 feet away from our campsite. We can see my mother and other sisters sitting by the fire. We are all relieved to almost be back, so we are joking around and continue to look at the footprints. Obviously, we do not want some hobo following us to camp or whatever they belong to. The prints got smaller and more closely spaced. My dad said this was very strange. This is where the story really truly starts to get wacky. The prince started to resemble that of a deer or a small elk, and we were all confused. My dad suggested maybe the deer or elk came from the water, which caused the marks to look bigger than they actually were. How could they start to look human or bear-like and then turn into deer hooves, though? That is not even the strangest part. The longer we stood there, the more information flooded in. The prints were one set of deer hooves, so unless we miss something, deer have always had four legs. Soon the prints stopped, just stopped entirely. About five feet from the trailhead, they just vanished. My dad scanned the area. The footprints did not go off into the trees anywhere. They did not go around. It was like whatever made them had just disappeared at that point. My sister laughed and shrugged it off, saying maybe the two-legged deer could fly. I started to feel sick to my stomach. I think the mix of the dark, the weird sounds, and the impossible footprints got to me. I ran back to the camp and promptly puked into some shrubs. I somehow got to bed that night simply fine, but I was not okay with what we found earlier that night. I knew I was safe, but part of me knew something was not right about those tracks and those noises. My dad woke me up the next morning and told me our dear friend visited us last night. I jumped out of bed and went to have a look. Sure enough, there were more deer tracks around the trailer. For the rest of the time we were there, we did not see any more two-legged deer prints or human prints, and we never heard any more noises. I still think about those tracks disappearing from time to time, and how they changed, and that god-awful sound. I tell myself that it was just wet deer tracks, 
but I cannot fully convince myself. If anybody has any questions, please comment them down below. I'd love to see them. I'm very curious to know what this could have been. If you hear about any other experiences in Island Park, I would be glad to share. Narrator's note, I have had a few viewers recently send me trail cam pictures of deers walking and doing weird things on their hind legs. I'm definitely going to post some of those pictures, so definitely check my channel tab to see that. I have had a few paranormal seeming experiences throughout my life. Nothing 100% confirmed though, I am open minded about it. But the one that stands out to me the most was a recent one, taking place in an Airbnb that I stayed in in Golden, Colorado. This was back in 2014. My husband and I were visiting Colorado and decided to stay in the Airbnb that was high up in the foothills of the Golden area in the Colorado Rocky Mountains. Golden is a beautiful town, old and founded during the Pikes Peak Gold Rush of 1859. I have no idea of how old the house itself was, probably not incredibly old, but it sat on land right above a railroad line which felt ancient. The area had a few houses scattered around rocky cliffs with foliage. We found some random objects strewn about up in the rocks just down the road from the house. It was part of the property. I thought I had more photos but I guess I must have deleted them, but I do have a few that I found recently. I did not touch any of them, just photograph them. We were there for maybe a week. There was this beautiful house with amazing views. I did not feel anything unusual vibe-wise except that the house itself had only a few window blinds. Houses far enough apart from each other, so I guess I didn't really need that. I occasionally thought I could feel someone inside looking in, even in the daytime though there was never anyone there. Again, it wasn't really spooky vibes though. Anyway, the last night we were there, my husband passed out on the couch with a bit of altitude sickness. I was about 10 to 15 feet across the room, packing up our things for our flight the next morning. As I'm folding a shirt, I feel what feels like a hand slowly coming down under my right arm. Under my armpit, as if it were coming around to grab me or hug me. It was not in a hurtful way, but gently and playfully. I was surprised, so I jumped back, thinking it was my husband who spooked me. I immediately turned around, and he was still laying on the couch, completely passed out, not standing behind me at all. I was spooked enough that I woke my husband up, and I sat next to him and told him exactly what happened. I remember even him saying something like, I never do this, right? And he was like, no, you, you really don't. I felt very vulnerable and it felt very real. It was fleeting, but real. My wife and I decided to make the drive to Colorado Springs on the recommendation of a friend of mine. She had never seen the mountains before, so I figured the Rockies would be perfect. We stayed in a Holiday Inn that was right at the base of the mountain, basically, and it had a great view of Pikes Peak, as soon as we looked out the window, we could see everything. She was thrilled. She had never seen anything like it before, and she is a sucker for a gift shop, so this place was great. We had a great time overall. On our second day, we decided to drive up to Pikes Peak, but we were told at the gate we could go up most of the way, but the summit was closed because there was too much snow. We could still go pretty far up though. I think Pikes Peak is around 14,000 feet and we got to like 11,000 feet before it was closed off. So, we were above the clouds, which was an awesome experience, because it just looked like we were out over the ocean. We stopped at the little rest area on the way up to get hot chocolate for the drive, and a magnet for Colorado, since we collect them for every state that we go to. It was cool, because we had Bigfoot crossing signs along the way up, and it was fun to take pictures in front of those. Anyway... Once we got to the closed off part of Pike's Peak, we parked our car on got out and just kind of took in the view. I did not think anybody else was up there with us, except there was a guy a little way up sitting in his truck making sure people did not go up any higher than they were supposed to. Even if we could not go to the summit, it was still gorgeous. We took some pictures, all of which were terrible, and it was cold. 
but I insisted we buy 5'11 jackets, pants, and boots for the trek. My wife did not understand why I demanded that brand, but if you're a dude, you know. So, we were toasty. I wandered off and started to look around the rocks, and what few trees were up at that elevation. I just like to explore stuff off the beaten path. I heard some snow crunching nearby and assumed it was just another sightseer. So, I moved toward the sound of the crunching snow, but oddly enough, I didn't see anybody. There are a few trees here and there, but not hard to really see. It was snowing a bit, however, and the wind was blowing the snow sideways. I had gone far from my wife at this point and did not want to stray too much farther, but I was honestly hoping to see a wolf or something. I found tracks in the snow and they were small. The snow was kind of deep, so I could not really tell what kind of animal made them, but it looked like a wolf. So, I was really hoping to see one. No, I did not see a wolf. At first, I did not see anything. I followed the tracks around a tree and kind of carefully peeked around it, but did not see a thing. The tracks stopped there, though. I did not get right up on the tree because if it was a wolf, I mean, I did not want to get face to face with it. I'll also say, I have no idea if there are any wolves in the Rockies. I was just sort of hoping. What I did see, eventually, was a pure white thing scurry away from the exact location I was looking at. It was pure white. I'm not sure if it was invisible or just blended in perfectly with the snow. It moved on all fours, had a huge bulbous head, kind of like what you would think of of a typical alien. It had a spindly body. Its arms and legs were super skinny, and its body was not a whole lot bigger. Its arms and legs themselves were long. I would say it was probably between four to five feet tall if it were standing upright. It was a bit hard to tell, with it always being on all fours and in the snow. It turned around and looked at me. It had small black eyes and no defining features. Its eyes were far apart and almost on the side of its head. Its feet and hands were buried in the snow, but when it went to move, I saw what its hand looked like. It had fingers that were just way too long. Not like E.T. long, but wiry, spindly type fingers. It looked at me for just a second, and then leaped forward away from me as soon as it landed in the snow. It was invisible again. Or maybe, I just couldn't see it anymore. Then it started hopping again, and it jumped a good six feet or so from a dead stop. It then took off running. It ran away from me and scaled some rocks in the distance like it was nothing, and crawled along the cliffside. Whenever it was in the snow, it looked invisible. I'm not sure if that was because it was all white or basically if it was just turning invisible, I don't know. Anyway, in a few seconds it was gone. When I got back to my wife, she was waiting in the car and did not believe a word of it and thought I was just trying to scare her. To this day, she does not believe me, and I don't know what it was. I have never heard of any cryptid or anything like it, and on the trek back, I asked the lady at the gift shop if people ever reported seeing weird things, and she just mentioned Bigfoot. I used to work in forest maintenance and forest agriculture for quite a while. Some of my friends owned a big plot of land in the Rocky Mountains. A group of us, we were all guys between the ages of 18 and 38 years of age, would gather several times a year, go into the mountains for a couple of days, and clear scrub brush, make fire breaks, and when appropriate, cut down Christmas trees. This time it was early spring and our crew of nine, on three gator four-wheel drive vehicles, was about 9,200 feet in elevation. There was a significant amount of snow on the ground. We had put in a long day's work and were headed back to camp, until the old guy of the crew asked if we wanted to head to the slope. This was a treeless slope, free of any large rocks about a hundred yards wide, with tracks of big trees on either side. We would go there and, using one of the gators, tow a tube downhill in the snow. It was so much fun. We got to the slope, set up a fire pit, cracked open the whiskey, and started having our fun. We all took several turns being towed. Jeff was the new guy and the youngest at 18. We were giving him the craziest rides, swinging him close to trees to freak him out, a sort of initiation of sorts. It was about 1 a.m., pitch black except for our dying fire and lightly snowing. Not the smartest or safest things I've ever done, but one of the most fun. Just as we were wrapping up the last of the rides and heading back to camp, Jeff freaked out. 
He was stumbling over his words and could not express himself very clearly. But finally, we got out of him that about three-fourths of the way down he had seen a man standing a few yards into the woods. He was wearing a trapper's hat, one of those with a flipped-up bill and ear flaps like in Fargo. This guy was also wearing a plaid Mackinac. We were all a bit skeptical. I mean, we were on a big plot of private property, at elevations of 9,000 plus feet in somewhat hostile weather. But we took the rifles off the gators and got our flashlights and gave it a look. We did not find anything. Not even footprints. We chalked it up to inexperience, spooky environment, and of course whiskey, and headed back to the camp about an eighth of a mile away. Jeff did not sleep all night. He was convinced he saw someone. The next morning, we drove the gators back to the house on the property, got in our trucks and headed into the little town nearby for breakfast. We had our breakfast and were heading back to the property to say our goodbyes and go our separate ways. As we neared the intersection of the public dirt road and the private dirt drive to the house, there were several police cars and an ambulance. We stopped to talk to the police who informed us the closest neighbors had found a body in the ditch as they were heading down the mountain. Police had followed in reverse footprints up the hill to the slope and then across a neighboring property to a perpendicular road. They asked if we knew anything about it, and of course we told them about the Mackinac man. Sure enough, it was him. A self-inflicted gunshot, probably just minutes after we encountered him. I still do not know what happened, or what he wanted, if we were in any danger, or what. But poor Jeff got his whiskey and meals paid for the next several weeks but he still gets scuff about it to this day. Thanks for listening to these creepy and allegedly true Rocky Mountain Horror Stories. As always, if you have a story that you would like to share in a future video, be sure to submit it at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I am always looking for more mountain range horror stories, whether it's from the Appalachian Mountains, the Rocky Mountains, the Ozarks, whatever. I'd love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp. If you enjoyed these stories, please be sure to hit that like button as it helps me out a lot in the YouTube algorithm. If you're listening on iTunes or another podcast platform, give this show a 5 star rating as it truly helps me. If you're new to the swamp, why not join us and help us expand our ever-growing waters? Hit the subscribe button and be sure to turn on notifications to never miss a new video, as I upload them almost every single day, in all things natural and supernatural. If you're on the go and want to listen to your favorite Swamp Dweller Scary Stories wherever you go, you can download them absolutely free from iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher Radio, and just about everywhere else you find your favorite podcast online. And like I said, it's absolutely free, and always will be. If you'd like to support The Swamp outside of hitting that like button and subscribing, maybe check out the merch store. I have face masks, t-shirts, hoodies, and much more for sale. Thank you guys, as always, for supporting The Swamp the way you do. I couldn't do this on a daily basis without you guys supporting. I'd love to know in the comments down below what story tonight was your favorite. This has been one of the longest viewer submitted videos I've done in a long time, and I hope you guys enjoyed it. I'm going to try to keep the videos longer this year, so be sure to send in your stories at swampdweller.net. I'll see you guys soon with some more creepy stories from the mountains.